We've skirted around the issue of uh, zone reconnaissance. Uh, that is, we discussed in past videos screening operations, we've discussed area defense. So now it's time to jump into reconnaissance. And I think the best place to start there is probably, arguably, the most fundamental, at least in terms of tactical uh, practice, of zone reconnaissance. Let's get into it right after we come back. I'm Dr. Christopher Larson, a veteran of the U.S. Army Infantry, founder of One Shepherd Leadership Institute, and author of Small Unit Tactical Doctrine. But before we get into zone reconnaissance, let's talk about just for a minute, let's do a quick overview on reconnaissance as a whole. There are several things that you have to keep in mind with reconnaissance, and right here from the Fort Benning um, Army website, um, there are the seven principles of reconnaissance. So, principle number one is develop the situation rapidly, and rapidly here is used subjectively, but that is to remember that all information has an expiration date. Just like milk, it's, it's good for this long. And typically one of the driving factors is it is good as long as the enemy doesn't yet know that you know. Because once the enemy knows that you know, they will do everything in their power, everything within their feasible capabilities to change what you think you know. Principle number two is do not keep reconnaissance assets in reserve. And this is very important. Um, you don't need to keep them in reserve. It's not like combat power where you say, uh-oh, if the enemy breaks through, I'll dispatch my drone. No, it, it doesn't make any sense. That said, huge caveat to do not keep reconnaissance in reserve is make sure you rest and maintain your reconnaissance assets. Yes, that includes drones and you know electronics that need to come back and recharge, repower, but it also includes human assets. Rotate them. Not to keep one in reserve, but to manage those that are in the rear. Ensure continuous reconnaissance. We just said that. Rotate them. That's principle number three. Keep managing them and keep rotating them out there. Gain and maintain enemy contact. Now that's principle number four. And it means enemy contact doesn't necessarily mean that you're trading bullets with them. Although it might enforce reconnaissance, and that's a whole different class we'll cover it another time. There is a point in time where speed is so important that uh, you want to come in contact with the enemy, even pick a fight with them and develop the situation from there. But generally, when we are using electronic surveillance, uh, including up to human uh, reconnaissance, we prefer to have a soft contact to gain observation of the enemy and maintain that observation. The less the enemy knows about this and is aware of our situation, the better. So you've heard me make the crack, uh, you know, kind of jokingly. Um, in Hollywood, the reconnaissance teams, you know, grab the German and they stab him in the back of the neck just to show him how, you know, tacty cool the reconnaissance teams are. This is absolute stupidity. This is an absolute abortion of reconnaissance. You're, you're observing somebody in a hide position. You've been there for five days, camouflage, peeing into a bottle, into a diaper, whatever it is, and now you're going to go give away the fact that you've observed them and you're relaying information back? Yeah, okay, so let's just go ahead and kill Gunther. What do you think Sven and all of his friends are going to come over and say, oh, Gunther, he was feeling so sad. He committed suicide 29 times in the back of the neck. Come on, guys. I mean, why not just go ahead and send a postcard? Anyway, um, you want to maintain freedom of maneuver. You don't want to become bogged down in a decisive fight. Even in reconnaissance and force, what you want to do is uh, always have the element of maneuver on your side so that you can gain a new vantage point. And this is, again, why in most cases, soft contact is preferred to hard contact with the enemy. Orient the reconnaissance on an objective. Don't send your reconnaissance out willy-nilly. You're not a you know, blind person grappling around in the dark. That, that's that, oh man, if that's where you are, you've, you're really on your back foot. Your reconnaissance assets should be focused on something very specific, some information that you want to know. Now this is called 
the critical or commander's critical information requirements CCIR and then when issued to or at least in this case when issued to a reconnaissance they're told look go look for these things and those are called your priority intelligence requirements your PIR but it's also on a geographic area in most cases as well not just the PIR but a geographic area so that this combat commander um, can have some kind of effect on that area. Report information rapidly and accurately. Um, again, rapidly comes up here showing you that information does have an expiration date and accurately says, don't exaggerate. You didn't see a company of armor because you saw two tanks. That's not a company. At the same time, accurate also includes reporting what isn't there that normally is. There are different historical uh, incidents of this. The one that pops into my head is um, in Afghanistan, uh, I believe the, the Battle of Takagar, um, Operation Anaconda, whereby the Special Forces units uh, from several branches, I'm not picking on one, they were in the area for whatever, a week or so before the operation began, and they were there as advanced assets, obviously ISR assets, and really doing a pretty good job, remaining undetected, observing the enemy, maintaining that soft contact, maintaining the uh, maneuver. They were doing a very good job. What they failed to do was report that there were no people in the villages. There were bad guys up in the high uh, terrain, which was to be expected, and there were bad guys down in the villages, uh, but what wasn't happening is normally you have civilians um, going back and forth and feeding people, making sure the logistics are taken care of, and there are, you know, normal day-to-day -day activities that villages go through. It wasn't reported that none of that was happening. In fact, the reconnaissance uh, assets saw no civilians in the area. And this should have been a huge red flag for what the operation was stepping into. Sometimes reporting accurately uh, isn't exactly what you think. It's not merely don't exaggerate. Tell me what you saw um, and nothing more. Well, no, no, that's not quite right. Tell me what you didn't see that you thought should be there. That's the principles of, all right. Um, now, having said that, that's the principles of, um, of reconnaissance foundations. What we're going to focus on specifically today is um, zone reconnaissance, okay, as opposed to area point reconnaissance, route reconnaissance, and reconnaissance in force. All right, let's get to the whiteboard. What we've got is this. We've got area of operations Swiss. And so this is the area that our reconnaissance team, uh, we're going to say it's a squad size. We'll break into that in just a minute. This is the area that our reconnaissance team has been given to conduct a zone reconnaissance on. And so AO Swiss, uh, as you can see, it has this area. Now, I grab natural features to put um, my maneuver graphics on. That is, this uh, brownish looking color here is clearly a ridge line, okay? Has your high point here and goes down from there if you count the number of rings. But this is a a ridge line to one side of ours, uh, in this case to the north, and to the south we see the blue line, there's a defined creek there. Look, we're going to stay to our side of the creek. We're not going to go on because we've got other people maybe operating in here for whatever reasons. That's the limit of our the left and right limit, the northern and southern boundary. We're going to enter from way back here, there's our line of departure, or line of departure and our limit of advance is all the way over here in this uh, half of the valley, so to speak. Command, Intel said, hey, we really have two named areas of interest very, very close to each other. One is the main fording site that uh, while anybody can walk across these, I believe vehicles can ford right here. So they believe this is the fording site of that uh, creek bed to get logistics in and out. And where this high ground um, comes down and this finger sticks out and protects um, you know, on the back side of this from observation back here in, from our friendly lines, they believe that there, there might be something hiding here. So this is named area of interest Big Ben, and this is NAI Grandfather. Now, what I wanted to do then is start breaking this into phase lines as, you know, if I'm the patrol leader, so I'm saying, okay, well, that's the NAI, so even before I get or as I get to the NAI, 
Uh, there's a natural swell out, you know, pushing south here on that, which is going to be hard to detect during the day or night. Kind of um, north, you see this is where the finger starts to gain high ground. And of course, that's going to be, that high ground is going to be our northern limit anyway in our AO, AO Swiss. That's kind of like day or night, I should be aware of this jutting out. I don't care where I'm walking, right? I should be, it's a pretty prominent feature, train feature. And so I'm going to call that phase line Casio, PL Casio. So I come back here and I say, well, I'm going to have phase line Timex. That's going to be my line of departure. I'm going to go on out, you know, about halfway to that. And I'm going to have a phase line Rolex. And, you know, here in Rolex, I'm looking at the saddle. Okay, because I, as I pass through here, hopefully I can look up there, whether I'm here, here, or even here. Particularly if I'm walking this area, I should be able to recognize, okay, that's really the first saddle we come to, right in between it and uh, making contact with the uh, creek. That's phase line Ro uh, Rolex, so Timex Rolex Casio, and then phase line Tag, as in Tag Heuer. Here again, there's a decisive gap. There's a little bit of a cliff between these two, right? Um, more than just a saddle, a sharp um, precipitous drop on both sides. And so that's going to be pretty evident to me. I'm going to call that phase line tag. And then finally, where the valley starts to pinch because of the long, slow slope of the ridge line and where the um, you know, creek line turns north, um, that's going to be my limit of advance. And so that's phase line omega. So again, I'm putting these on places that hopefully my foot patrols will be able to visually reference. You know, I can tell what my northern limit is and my southern limit is, but what are each one of these phase lines? I want to give them a visual reference, hopefully that works in day and night. And why again do we have these? Well, so that we can report, hey, I've just pulled my seals halt at phase line Rolex. Hey, we're pushing on, we're coming up to phase line Casio past uh, Casio and NAIs, we're now pushing on to PL tag, reaching phase line Omega. What I don't want to say is my limit of advance. It's telling the enemy things if they're listening on the radio that I don't want them to know. Furthermore, you'll notice I didn't put the uh, phase lines in alphabetical order or even like the cheapest to the most expensive. Let me double check that. No, second one was Rolex. You, you don't want to have a logical flow like that. You want to be it to be randomized, okay? Um, because again, this gives uh, communication security and operational security. So here's the maneuver control um, graphics overlay of our AO Swiss that we've been as a squad um, tasked to conduct a zone reconnaissance. And so there's several different techniques we can use. One thing is that we're going to enter the AO and maybe just, I don't know, I don't know how far this is, but let's say it's a couple of hundred, few hundred meters already. We do our passage of lines, we cross in the line of departure and go into our uh, seals halt, okay? It's the first one we're gonna do. We're gonna all get together here, just listen um, into the AO, see if we do in fact wanna do this or if we believe we're already compromised. I mean, are there tanks and dogs chasing us already? And uh, then we'll you know, unass and we'll go back. Assuming all sounds and smells and looks good, we're going to press on. We're going to go into our first circle. Now, let me call this one out. This will be an ORP, Objective Rally Point. Let me explain why this will be an ORP, and that is just an ERP. None of these are assault positions. Uh, this one the seals halt is the closest thing to an assault position. But we're not assaulting anything, so it's definitely not that. Still, it's close, and here's why. We don't plan to go back to that seals halt, okay? We are not going back to it. Well, that is also true of assault positions. We're not leaving anything back or anybody back in an assault position. Um, if we did that, then that's no longer an assault position. That becomes an objective rally point. And this is what makes it weird if we're coming back. So the objective rally point is also a bit of a weird one because it's saying, hey, this is the last rally point before the big objective. And that's problematic because here's our big objective. So what do you call these? Are they a series of in route rally points, ERPs versus ORPs? That might be even more appropriate yet. I don't care which one you call it as long as it's communicated, hey, this is a zone reconnaissance. We're going to have many different uh, ERPs or ORPs, whatever you want to call them. I would encourage you that I think 
the closest, and, and this is a bit of a fudge factor because there's lots going on, but the closest thing that we would call these are ERPs, in route rally points. And so we're going to go into an in route rally point, and now I'm going to um, disperse my teams. Let's say I have three fire teams, because um, I'm, I'm a squad, right? I'm going to go over here and say, okay, fire team, you know, alpha goes up this way. And they do their first ERP, Bravo, their ERP. Command team might go with them right down the middle. That would make sense, you know, just in theory from a command and control. So remember, you got a four man fire team, a four man fire team. This is Charlie, ERP, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, something like that, right? Well, the two man team would stay with them. But here's what you're going to do you're going to send out from here, from each one of those, um, we're going to use a fan method. A fan method means one, uh, generally, one team goes out at 12 o'clock, looks around, comes back in at the 3 o'clock, and looks around, and but doesn't enter. It goes out like this and then comes back in at the 6. At the same time, the other two-man team left out of the 6, comes back, looks at the 9, comes back in at the 12. Okay? Why am I sending them out like this? Well, I'm trying to avoid them bumping into each other. Okay, and they're going to come back in and talk. Now, I can do that because I've got a command team sitting here, two-man uh, squad leader and deputy squad leader, um, if you're using the 14-man squad. So I've got a two-man team, and he can dispatch two buddy teams, whereas this one might be done slightly different. They might take turns. One team goes out at the 12 o'clock, looks around, looks around, looks around, comes back in at the 12 o'clock, and the other guy just sits there and holds that position. Why is it important for him to hold, you know, the other two guys, the other buddy team, to hold that position? It gives the reconnaissance team not only something to guide on in their fan, but it also keeps people from getting lost. Think about doing this at night. Think about doing this in thin, you know, dense vegetation or something like that. I'm not joking. It becomes very easy to get turned around. It also puts less moving parts out there, so we're much less likely to bump into each other. Because that's, unfortunately, uh, one of two things happens. We bump into something that we don't know what it is. We either hopefully don't light it up and shoot, but sometimes inexperienced troops tend to do that. Or we go to the ground and go, oh, we got to wait for them, wait for them. Little do we know, it's our own people out there who went to the ground and were waiting, and we're all losing time here. We're losing hours as we wait for the other guy to move, right? Only to go, oh, it's you. So these have to be coordinated a bit carefully. So I'm going to say the same thing. This one's doing a out at 12, out at 6, two fire, or excuse me, two two-man buddy teams at a time. These two, because they are just a fire team, are kicking one at the 12 o'clock that does the whole entire trip themselves, then comes in, and they'll alternate that for the next one. So you can see we've got fans covering here. We've got this ERP, we've all got there, we can report back uh, to our squad leader, um, however it's designated, um, and then we say, yep, here's what we found, you know, disseminate your information at least in your ERP, if not find a runner to come in and talk to the squad leaders, okay, let's go, we're ready to move again. So then we move again. We move forward, this one's going to punch out a little bit so that we can go up here, and this one's going to continue moving this way, great. And this one's going to punch out a little farther down. Now we can stretch our legs a little more. Remember, the first two-man buddy team sat there as the anchor point, kicking the other one out to do all the walking, snooping, and pooping. Now that should be rotated. Okay, we kick out at 12 o'clock. We go up here. We look. We come back. We say, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I see him again. Okay. And then we come in at 12 o'clock. Out at 12 o'clock, in at 12 o'clock. Same thing here. Why are we going in and out at 12 o'clock? Again, it's allowing those other two guys to know who the heck is looking at them, and they can do the, you know, the number combination of challenge and password, running passwords, whatever the case merits. Uh, once again, this one's doing it slightly different because they have more manpower, and I want to illustrate that. One guy goes out and comes in at six, or excuse me, one buddy team. The other buddy team goes out at six, nine and comes in at 12. And again, they're avoiding bumping into each other. But you can see we're covering down. Each one of these loops, how far out is that? That is going to be dependent on so many things. Um, it, but Met TC dependent, right? Mission, enemy, time, terrain, troops available, and civilians in the battlefield. Okay, but more practically, here's what's happening. They're walking out far enough 
so that they can't see their anchor point at the ERP. They're walking up far enough so that the anchor point cannot hear or see them, and then they come in, take a peek, come in, take a peek, come in, take a peek. Each time they take a peek, they're, they're really seeing what they hope to see, their own ERP. So the real work is out here in these long fans going out, uh, out of sight and out of um, sound. Um, they're really looking for enemy activity. Now what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for lots of things. So they're looking for, um, you know, slug trails. That is, where the enemy walked, foot trails, or where the enemy, enemy, enemy drug themselves. Do they find trash along that? Does the trash give them any indication of what status this uh, enemy force is? Well, one thing it can do is if you're finding, you know, all trash from with Russian writing, okay, probably not the U.S. or Brits in the area. It's probably the Russians you're, tra you're tracking now, right? Because it's got Russian writing on it or Chinese writing or whatever it is, right? So that's some intel right there is trash. Also, you can start to see how many. Are, are the trash, I don't know, let's go with spoons or chopsticks. I found eight set of chopsticks in their trash. It's a pretty good indication that you're following a patrol of eight. Warriors are... Uh, by nature aren't very environmentally conscious and, and aware and that is to say that they tend to throw their trash and poop all over the place. You can count poop to know how many people are there. If you find a place that becomes all matted and you see a cigarette or a candy wrapper or a gum wrapper or something like that, you're going, whoa, 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 they took, they took a break here. So we can look for vegetation that's pushed to the side. It's getting a little into tracking, isn't it? Yeah, I'm looking for vegetation, the snapping of twigs, what direction are they moving? Oh, the vegetation's following this way. Look here, they stopped. I found a cigarette over here and two gum wrappers over there. Looks like someone sat their butt here and sat their butt. Oh, look, someone sat a radio here. You can see the imprint. Things like gum wrappers and cigarette wrappers. When you're into tracking, there are people who will just throw their cigarettes, half-smoked cigarettes, in their basement, then outside, and take a picture of how many days each day. Well, this is the morning and this is the dew point. And they'll watch how that cigarette deteriorates so that when they're out here doing reconnaissance, they can literally pick this up and go, yeah, man, that looks like about three. It didn't rain last night. Yeah, this cigarette looks like about three days old. So we're looking at a patrol that passed through here maybe three days ago. It's got Chinese writing on it. These are Chinese brand cigarettes. These are very, very important things. And yes, um, that's really getting into the tracking part of this expertise. Um, this is more of the technique. But when we say, what are we looking for? We're looking for lots of things. Obviously, evidence of enemy movement, patrolling evidence, you know, direction, size, all of those things in a salute, right? Size, activity, location, uniform, time, and equipment. We're looking at many different things. We're looking at the terrain and the weather. Uh, how easy is it to pass through this zone? Where does the enemy seem to be passing? Where's their high traffic area versus their low traffic areas, right? So there's a whole lot of things to look at here beyond these very specific priority intelligence requirements. So we see a fan developing, like there's a fan here. And each time we're gonna push through, we're gonna say, well, let's go do that again. And so we're gonna go up here, I'm gonna do a new one. And each time, um, these fans keep moving out, and each time there should be a way of uh, reporting back into each other too. Whether that's by radio and we take the time to encrypt things, uh, or whether it's by uh, runner, you know, courier. You're not having any electronic emissions if you're sending a runner in between these to say, hey, here's what we found. You guys ready? You good? Let's move. It's very, very safe. It's very secure in that sense. But number one, it's slow. Uh, electronic communication is so much faster. And number two, you do run the risk. There's risk in everything. You run the risk of exposing each other, being seen or heard by the enemy as you do those things. I'm not saying one size fits all. What I tend to say is uh, have a communication plan in tandem. That is, have your primary, have your backup, have a backup to the backup. So you see what's happening here is these are zones and so this is the fan method and what we're using by the way I'm going to go ahead and tell you is a converging method we're going to come in together and converge um, there are um, sequential methods whereby one team goes and does theirs and the other team then comes and does theirs or even what if I had one fire team and I had to cover this whole thing so I'm gonna have one fire team go out here we're gonna zigzag back through the center then we're gonna come down here so you can see why I'm glad 
that we are covering this with an entire 14-man squad, three fire teams of brass, and we're going to separate and then uh, converge back on close to the LOA. That's what we're doing, and you can see, you have to allow enough. They are doing reconnaissance here in these short um, sprints, not, not a sprint, sorry, not a run, but in these um, distances between, we might be column of file right column file or or even wedge potentially depending on the terrain of course and, and visibility but we're still looking then we stop then we do it again what's the distance here should these overlap met tc dependent if i can see from one to the other then no they don't need to overlap um but in some cases if this is dense jungle right um or or dense high grassland above my head, then yeah, very likely they do need to overlap. Those are pretty extreme cases, but nonetheless, um, this is the concept of the maneuver. The specifics of it get right down to, um, like I said, you know, mission, enemy, time, terrain, troops available, and civilians on the battlefield. So we're going to keep moving each time. Now at some point, we may want to change and then all converge here. It might be the case that we say, hey, we want to converge all on Big Ben. Or we might want to leapfrog it. And at this point, he says, no, 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 no. We'll hold here. You go high. So this guy goes, all right, I'm going to come through here. Do, do something kind of a hook. While these two hold fast, why would they want to do that? Because it allows a smallest footprint forward, right? And so this guy goes over here and he says, hold on. We're going to go nice and sneaky, sneaky in a great big, just to see if we can see anything. You know, we're really not seeing anything. Huh, interesting. Now that might be electronic report back, whatever he says, interesting. Okay, well then let's send the next one forward. And so you don't have to all do this exactly at the same time, uh, but you can see, you can plan it out so that it's uh, in almost like a leapfrog, a bound and overwatch um, kind of effect. So think about how you want to do it, but nonetheless, this guy goes out and says, all right, well, yeah, we're seeing what we see. Hmm, yep. See lots of, uh, we're seeing tire tracks over here. There's plenty of evidence that there are motor vehicles. Uh, we're seeing small light vehicles, maybe, uh, you know, Jeeps or uh, motorcycles or whatever the case is. So they're reporting that back and he says, yeah, interesting. Okay, you're not finding anything and bad guys. And so now we're going to continue moving and we're going to bring up our center team and he's going to go right into one and same thing this is getting monotonous guys <laughs> here we go you see what's happening here is that we're going to continue going out all the way until we get to the end and then we wind up converging on the last um, erp these will go through a series they'll come up here okay this will go through a series it'll come up here all right and then eventually they'll converge back and we'll meet back up um, at, according to plan so that we can then go back through the AO and go link up with our, uh, you know, our forward line or continue a mission to some, somewhere else, right? Whatever they may frag us, that is a fragmentary order that reassigns us. And it could assign us to anything. It could say, you gave me information on this. I want you to go back and further look at that. It's very common that this happens. Uh, they may ask you to form into surveillance teams where you go into a hide position where you can observe this longer. They want to see, um, are the enemy moving through here at night? Or they may say, well, you found like a really good place to set up an ambush. Go ahead and, and choose a place and set up an ambush all night long. There's lots of things that can happen from here. But the point is that I wanted to kind of give um, the general uh the general schema, an ellipsis, right? Just like when you're writing, you're saying dot, dot, dot. Okay, this continues through here, right? At the density that's appropriate to the terrain and the mission. But this is the schema of a zone reconnaissance. Most commonly, uh, it is handled by multiple fire teams uh, in a fan method, in a converging fan method. There are exceptions to that, of course. And if it was a single fire team, you know, uh, that would just be a very long day of weaving back and forth under some scheme of maneuver. But it can be done. There's no question about it. Um, so, yes, this is how the scheme of maneuver goes. And again, it kind of gives you an indication of what you're looking for. Obviously, 
uh, we tend to be focused mostly on enemy, enemy activity, enemy in the AO. Uh, we want to make sure that we are disseminating the information to each other and then uh, getting it back, whether that's radio or however we've, whatever we've arranged for, we need to get that back to our uh, commanders in a timely um, of manner. Why do we continually disseminate the information? If we find something, if we came up here to Big Ben and we found something critically important and unfortunately we were discovered by the enemy, we were disclosed, the enemy would then pursue us and they would be uh, well advised in most cases to try to kill every single one of us off before we could get back to our higher command. And so by disseminating the information, it's not like 14 of us are running away, but only these four really know why and what, what's so important. Oh, but they all died, so, you know, half of us make it back being pursued by the enemy, but the half that make it back don't know what happened, and they don't know why we were running away, and we, they don't know what was so important. Whereas if somewhere we stop and say, okay, guys, here's what I saw. They've got nuclear silos and little green men from Mars, and, uh, you know, and, and they're working with the alien space Nazis. Okay, that's really important for higher command to know because they probably didn't even know the existence of alien space Nazis. And so we really want to let them uh, know what the heck they're up against. That's why we disseminate the information is so that everybody um, can, uh, can deliver uh, the important news to the commander if we make it out of there alive, right? Always disseminate your information. You want to report it in a timely manner. And often we either report it in a salute format or the SALT format format, which is just an abbreviated format, meaning size, activity, location, and time. That's really the, uh, the most important things. So what the enemy is doing and where they are and how big they are and when that information was last observed. I think this is pretty much the overview. This certainly isn't a deep dive, but this is a good overview of zone reconnaissance um, as a schema and a function. Any questions, you know, just leave them there in the comments section. I'll try to get to them. Thanks. Bye.